Um, welcome to today's UMTRC webinar. Uh, my name is Becky Sanders. I'm the program director for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. We're pleased to have you with us today. And today we uh, are bringing back Marie Lee, who is no stranger to our webinar series. Marie was also one of the speakers at our July annual conference, our third annual conference, and we had so much positive feedback from the conference and people saying that, you know, they were all of the sessions were so good they couldn't hardly pick between them. So we wanted to bring Marie back one more time um, to do the same presentation for you. As a reminder, we are recording the session today. Um, Ms. Uh, Marie will be sharing the slides. We'll post them on, on our archive webinars page and the video will be accessible there as well as on our YouTube page. Um, we're gonna hold questions till the end. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen for questions, just in case we don't get to them all so we have them uh, in a written format that we can follow up with Marie and get those answered. If you have technical issues, then please use the chat function and we'll get your questions answered there as well. All right, so Marie, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Sounds great. Thanks again for having me back. Uh, and if you haven't had an opportunity to go to a UMTRC conference, I highly recommend it. They are fabulous, great networking, uh, lots of lots of great content, as uh, as Becky mentioned. So uh, it was really good to be a part of it again, and uh, I am happy to be back this afternoon with you. So we'll talk a little bit today about the application of comprehensive device-enabled exams via video. So again, this is like Video Visits Plus. What we're hoping to talk about today, or what I'm hoping to get across to you today, is to look at Really, what are the requirements for setting up that real-time audio video exam-enabled program where that provider is in a clinical setting and the patient is either in another clinic setting or in their home environment? Take a look at some programs that might be appropriate for this physical exam where a patient is physically distant from that provider and really look at the advantages and possible disadvantages of workflows where that device hardware and software integrates with a system's electronic medical record system. Just to give you a little bit of background on Henry Ford, if you don't already know, we're located primarily in Southeastern Michigan, but also in central lower Michigan. Uh, and we encompass uh, obviously a pretty big area. We've got about 33,000 employees. We have employed physicians. I think one of the most unique things or one of the more unique things is that we do have our health alliance plan. So our health insurance plan is under that Henry Ford umbrella. We are an Epic shop as well. So our EMR, when I reference our EMR, it, I am talking about Epic. So I'm part of a small but mighty team of, uh, of virtual care serving our very large health system. And our virtual care mission statement is evolving innovative care delivery to enhance health and wellness through accessible technology that drives connection and collaboration when, where, and how it's needed most. So we really are focusing on what are the things that we can do to really engage our patients and our providers, uh, not only real time, but maybe in an asynchronous format, if that's appropriate. And we're looking at that whole experience to come together as part of that virtual care. So we're looking at our right patient, right time, right intervention, right provider in the right place. Looking specifically at video visits. Obviously, the pandemic did a lot for virtual care across the system or across uh, the United States, across the world in terms of telehealth. And we know that those definitions uh, of what that telehealth looks like can be very different. Looking specifically at video visits, those were very, very well received by patients and providers during the pandemic as a way to stay connected but not physically have to come into the office. And there's a lot of things that can be done via video. But where video alone falls short is that physical piece or that physical exam. And even with our video visit enhancements, we still can't, the provider can't get their hands physically on the patient, but they can get things like a really good view of their ear, nose, and throat. They can listen to their heart and lung sounds. Um, they can get very high definition images uh, using a, a, a really nice camera other than, well, the, the cameras on most smartphones are pretty nice, but not everybody has access to that. 
And then of course, some other compatible devices that will Bluetooth into this to really, again, give a more comprehensive exam for that provider to get a, a, a better read of what's happening with the patient. So what this device enabled video visit would look like or what the, what the kit itself looks like, I'm actually gonna stop sharing for just a quick moment. And I'm gonna do a quick show and tell of what this looks like. I don't know if it's full screen or not, Becky, I apologize. But this is, this is our home kit. And I just, for size and reference, I wanted to show that to you. I'll go ahead and start sharing again. It works a little better when everybody's in the same room. <laughs> we can pass it around. So the device is really just, it's, it's a handheld device. It's about the size of a softball. And all of these different attachments are available for the provider to drive the exam or what exam that they're looking to have done. And the patient on their end has a very user-friendly uh, format, shows them exactly what connection to use and how to go ahead and get a good exam for the, pay, or for the provider so the provider can see it on their end. The, exam, uh, the exams that can be done, again, ear, nose, throat, heart rate, temperature, uh, high definition skin, heart sounds and heart rate, lung sounds, abdominal sounds. It gives, again, these very high, um, high definition and high quality images for the provider to be able to look at. From the provider end, right now, uh, providers do need to use a computer to log in, get the video of the patient on one side, and then a picture of what the exams are kind of side by side. So it's, this is their dashboard or their, their setup. With the next software enhancement coming from TitoCare, which again is, is the device that we're using, providers will actually be able to use a tablet. The feedback that we're getting from our providers are that they'd like to be able to use their smartphones, but the problem is on a smartphone, they just don't have a lot of, there's just not a lot of real estate on a smartphone to be able to see that image of the patient and to get a good view of the exams that they're performing. But again, the providers are very, very strongly asking for this. We've pushed and we've talked with TitoCare. Uh, it's, it's down the road, it's on their roadmap, but the next step coming up very soon will be that the providers can do that on a tablet format as well, which makes it a little bit more mobile for the provider. So there's a couple of videos embedded with this um, PowerPoint. I don't know that it's necessary to show you specifically what that looks like. Um, let me see, I don't, I'll, I'm actually gonna skip through this. Uh, but again, if, if you get the PowerPoint presentation and would like to take a look at these videos, please do. And it really, again, just shows from a patient perspective how easy it is to use the device. And then from a provider perspective, again, they're just choosing what exam to go ahead and use uh, for that patient. So again, another video which just walks the patient through what it looks like. And uh, she shows an example of doing an ear exam. When looking at exam enabled video visits, really there's a lot of different opportunities where this could be very useful and very helpful. One that we're, we're looking at and we're, we're promoting very heavily right now is direct to consumer. And that's where the patient actually buys the device. Uh, they can buy it from a health system like Henry Ford Health System. Uh, we've got uh, opportunities to do that through our website. Uh, patients can buy this through Best Buy, depending on the area. If uh, a health system has an exclusivity deal with TitoCare, they might be tied to a specific health uh, health center, but in other cases, they can buy the device and find a provider that actually utilizes the title care. The idea behind that direct consumer piece, though, is that a, you can buy that for the household. So if you have kids in the household or maybe uh, older uh, adults in the household, this is really meant for a household use, not just one person. So one kid actually serves multiple people. And, and obviously there's opportunities for not only urgent care, but maybe for some sort of family medicine. Where we're looking at other opportunities as well are things like 
high utilizers of emergency rooms, and maybe there's an opportunity to keep those folks out of the emergency room if they have a device like this in their home. Uh, also, maybe some sort of chronic care where we want to keep closer tabs on patients uh, and, and be able to not necessarily have to bring them into the clinic to monitor what's going on, but really have some periodic checkpoints where we can get a physical exam and see what they're doing and make recommendations or maybe changes based on that. In some cases, even with a post-discharge, we might be looking at sending a medical person to a patient's home where the medical person is, is driving the device. And then in other cases, it's more of that direct to consumer where the patient has the device and maybe either the patient themselves or a caregiver in the home would be driving that device for the provider. And then another application that is useful as well is employee wellness or even school wellness, where it's not financially feasible to have a provider physically on site at a particular location. Volume of patients doesn't really make sense, but if there's an opportunity to use this physical exam-enabled device where they can connect back to a provider that's available and possibly serving multiple locations, we can have that almost like a primary care clinic or a regular clinic available right in an employee or right in a school location. What we found even post-pandemic when we have patients and providers who are much more open to the idea of using virtual care and much more open to the idea of doing these exams and visits at a distance is that we still have to make it easy for both patients and providers to use. If it's not easy to use, if it's a lot of hassle, if there's you know a lot of hoops they have to jump through or, or set up and connections that they have to do, they don't want to do it. So when we started utilizing Tido Care, we were in a non-integrated environment where the Tido Care device connected to a Tido Care app for the patient, and they had to create their own account and they needed a username and a password. And then from the provider side, they had to log into the Tido platform with their own username and password. Uh, it's sometimes good that it's outside of the electronic medical record. It, it gives some more flexibilities, but where we find some advantages with that integrated electronic medical record system is that just because it's, a, it's still a separate application, but it's a single sign-on. And in this case, or in our case, with integrated workflows, we can launch from the provider side directly from the patient's chart in Epic. And then from the patient standpoint, they can log directly into their patient portal and launch the visit directly from their patient portal. Again, it's still bouncing them to an external application outside of the EMR or outside of the patient portal application, but it doesn't require that separate sign-on. So it makes it a lot easier. We have a couple of, again, I, I mentioned this already, but we have situations where a patient is in a clinical setting. So the Henry Ford provider in our case is at a central location. We have a telepresenter who is physically with the patient. It could be an RN, it could be an MA, it could be a paramedic, it could be a, a well-trained, you know, insert title here. And those folks, the telepresenters then are physically with the patient. They make sure the patient gets checked into their visit. They do some of that pre-visit assessment as it's appropriate, getting those vitals, blood pressure, whatever it happens to be. Those folks are also responsible for the sanitation of equipment in between visits. Uh, scheduling, when we use it in, our, in Epic, we have a scheduling process by which we hold time on the schedule where the patient physically shows up as well as where the provider will be seeing the patient. So it looks like there's two providers attached to one visit. And what that drives is just coordination between schedules to make sure that the time is available for both that telepresenter where the patient shows up, as well as matching time for that provider to actually see the patient. And then all that documentation and connection is in the electronic medical record system. When we talk about the direct to consumer side, again, this is where a patient is not physically in a clinic, they're wherever they happen to be, whether it's home, work, 
you know, someplace private, hopefully because they're, they're doing some sort of an exam. And in this case, the telepresenter is either the patient themselves or a caregiver who happens to be in the home. Scheduling happens either, uh, for us, it's an on-demand kind of schedule where, where patients are looking for an on-demand or a quick or an urgent care kind of visit, and or it is a scheduled visit with a primary care provider. And again, that documentation and connection happens in an integrated format through the electronic, electronic medical record system. So patients launching from their patient portal, providers launching directly from the patient chart. A couple of use cases, wanna just talk through some of the use cases where we've been very successful with Tito Care. We started with school-based health and this was definitely pre-pandemic. We had a lot of opportunity to do this in schools. And really what we found is that the need was in our Detroit public schools, there was a, a huge lack uh, of pedi access to pediatric service. And there was a lot of uh, visits to the ED Students were absent a lot. And yes, there could be a school nurse, but in some cases, the acuity of the patients or the need of the patient was really beyond that RN level. And so what we saw was an opportunity to have mid-level providers actually provide that higher level of care. But from a cost standpoint, we couldn't physically house that, that mid-level provider at all of the schools. So before Tito Care, we would have that mid-level provider sort of bounce between schools. But of course, how do you know when a kid is gonna get sick in one location and is it gonna coordinate with the time and, uh, that the mid-level provider is actually at that physical school? Or now do you have them at a central school and transport the child? That adds a lot of time, obviously time out of class for the student. Um, coordination is a challenge, especially with parent parental consent and moving kids, the whole, the whole nine yards. So, Having a centralized provider where the patient could then just go to their school clinic and be connected to that mid-level provider and that mid-level provider then could get that full exam, obviously that, that cuts out a lot, of, a lot of movement here. The challenge from a, from a compliance and just from a concern standpoint is consent forms. That was the big thing. And what we found is that if those consent forms were distributed and returned at the beginning of the school year, it covered students for that entire school year, and really it allows for that, um, for that care as long as the child attends the school for that school year. We were able to expand the services of that mid-level provider to serve 10,000 new students in less than six months. So we could really increase and open up the availability to the 14 different schools that are in and around the Detroit area. Again, those underserved areas where they have that lack of pediatric care. Uh, and then we were able to actually really increase the use and utilization of those clinics because now those patients could come. And again, if they needed higher level of care, we had that ability for them to be able to see that nurse practitioner. Even though it was over video, they're still getting that full physical exam. COVID did have an impact, of course. Schools were closed. Uh, students went to uh, virtual learning. In a lot of our schools though, the clinics actually had an external door uh, so that you didn't have to go into the school to get into the clinic. And those schools were actually stayed, uh, those clinics were able to stay open in some cases because this was a closer clinic than students would have been able to go to a pediatric site. That was their closest clinic in the community. And then in some cases, the schools were used as community testing sites. We're just rolling into a new school year, so we're kind of revamping and, and uh, reassessing what's going on. But of course, we're back to in-school or in-person learning this year. So it will be uh, interesting to see what 2021-2022 school year brings. <coughs> Pardon me. Our second use case that I want to go ahead and highlight is our sk skilled nursing facility. Our physicians who are covering the skilled nursing facilities, limited resources, a couple, you know, multiple locations, very far apart. And obviously you don't want to spend your time and your money with your physician driving. That's not helpful to your patients at all. 
but it is important to make sure that there is some sort of an exam because if we're just doing phone calls, that provider doesn't have necessarily the, the information that they need to know, can the resident be treated in place or do they actually need to be transferred to a higher level care like an emergency department or hospital? We were able to partner with skilled nursing facility staff and they're the ones that are acting as the telepresenters and the exam enabled uh, visits for residents who sign a telehealth waiver. Now, again, that provider when they're covering off hours, when they're not physically on site, but there is a need for some sort of an assessment, they can go ahead and have that higher level exam or that physical exam and get a better, um, a better connection with the patient. They can see and talk to the patient, but then they can also hear their lungs and see in their ear, nose and throat. And again, make that better physical assessment. One of the huge challenges that we've come across is really honestly just the staff comfort with the technology and when it's appropriate to use. Uh, the second big challenge uh, is consent forms. Uh, I don't know, kind of hand in hand with that staff comfort of the technology, I don't know that the staff right now is effectively communicating what the benefit is of virtual care to those families at the time of admission. So we're working through those challenges right now. And it's, it's just been really interesting because again, I don't know that they have a lot of comfort with the technology, even though when we've done the training session, everybody says, oh my gosh, this is really easy. Uh, again, uh, ease of use uh, and, and the and continued use, I think really helps drive that adoption. One of the other challenges just across the board with our Taito devices is equipment maintenance, making sure that the device is charged, making sure that However, they're connecting with that device. A lot of times it's an iPad, making sure the iPad is charged, making sure we know where the charging cords are at. So those, those go along with the challenges of having an extra device. The outcomes, providers do have that ability to examine the patients, make a more informed decision. And in terms of the COVID impact, there were less people in and out of a facility. And the more that we could reduce patient transfers, the more that we could reduce staff in and out of a facility, obviously that's a really good thing. Moving forward, it'll be interesting again to see how much that adoption takes place and how we're able to spread this into other skilled nursing facilities. Uh, again, I have a video here, but I'm not gonna show that right now. But we, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is employer clinics. So another opportunity is really around those employer clinics where we know we have a lot of people in a building, although of course COVID changed that a little bit, <clears throat> but as people are coming back to the workplace, having access to a primary care physician or some sort of uh, you know, family medicine physician in their workplace obviously has all kinds of benefits because we wanna improve the employee experience and their satisfaction and really reduce time off work and if we can provide them with an opportunity to get that primary care in their, in their work location, obviously that's, that's huge. So we were able to not only partner with our health alliance plan or our health plan and use this or pilot this at their headquarter location, we also partnered with one of our large automotive companies that happened to be located in Southeastern Michigan. And in each case, we staff that clinic with a medical assistant who acts as a telepresenter and, and can also do non-doctor things that are needed like flu shots and uh, possibly blood pressure rechecks, those kinds of things. So that MA does a lot of things, kind of those other duties as assigned in addition to connecting with the provider and helping the patient through those physical exams. What we've done with our employer clinics is that we do have a pool of providers that are managing our on-demand service. So again, as those providers are waiting for patients to get in line to be seen for our urgent care services via video, they can also manage our employer clinics where those patients are scheduling time on a schedule to be seen at a particular time. And so we're able to effectively manage and prioritize those scheduled visits and make sure that folks in the, the clinic locations that are checking in at a particular time are able to be seen on time. In both cases, employees reserved appointments 
via a web page and or could actually walk into the clinic and get scheduled. And these visits are insurance billed. They were, again, just a regular primary care visit, primary care copay, that kind of thing. One of the initial challenges was identifying and building the clinic space to accommodate both uh, that in-person and virtual offering. So we wanted to remodel existing space in the employer's physical location and make sure it was appropriate for a medical clinic. That can sometimes be a challenge. Obviously, we can't just pick any room. We need a room you know, with access to a sink. And you know, again, depending on what, what the full suite of services are, we need to make sure that we have all of the things that are appropriate for a medical location. Finding that engaged telepresenter. This is a slightly different flow of a clinic. Uh, again, the MA really has a lot of additional duties because they're kind of holding down the fort by themselves. They're not, they're not in a clinic location where they have a lot of interaction with a lot of the different clinical staff, at least not in person. So we did need to find those right telepresenters or those right, that right fit for those clinics. And then as we've kind of continued to have success with our, our pilot locations and our automotive location, we're looking at how do we expand this to other employer groups? And, and then even further, because we're in a physical location and it's not HAP, in this case, it's, it's an automotive uh, provider, how do we handle folks who maybe aren't already patients of our health system? And so we're just looking at the different challenges and workflows to make sure that we're streamlining it as much as possible. We initially launched with HAP back in June of 2019. So obviously very pre-pandemic. We did launch with General Motors uh, in June of this year. And it was a pretty slow rollout for our General Motors program. So our HAP program is actually still closed because of COVID. Uh, we haven't brought a lot of employees back to that building yet. When we launched General Motors, it was at their tech center in Warren, Michigan, and not very many of their employees were back to uh, being in person yet. So they had a very skeletal crew, but we went ahead with that launch anyway. And they've been seeing a, a, a fairly steady number of, of patients. And I think more and more of their uh, staff will be coming back to the tech center starting in September. What's very interesting from our HAP information and our patient survey responses is that most everybody was incredibly happy and satisfied with their experience. They were very likely to recommend. And I think what's most important is 91% indicated that they would have probably missed work if having a clinic in their employee and their employee location was not an option. Moving on to mobile integrated health. This idea or this, this came about because we were really looking at ways to reduce readmissions for high-risk patients. So was there a way to do an appropriate follow-up with a physical exam to ensure that patients were not coming right back and, and being readmitted? This was offered to patients discharged from very specific units of our hospital, and we partnered with our community paramedics who do visit the patient at home within one to two days of discharge, do the assessment, and then act as a telepresenter so that discharging physician can get the physical exam. The challenges as we move out into the community, network and accessibility, Wi-Fi, do we have reliability to actually get connected? That's been a challenge ongoing. And then the second piece is really that coordination of the visit with the patient, ensuring that we have uh, an appropriate time and location. Sometimes patients getting discharged from the hospital are not going to their home, but maybe to someone else's home. So really making sure that we're capturing the right information so that those paramedics get to the right location and the right patient. This program was also launched in June of 2019. We relaunched it in April of 2020, so we did relaunch during COVID. Paramedics have been able to conduct additional services like home assessments. And since that relaunch, we've seen, uh, this number is probably a little bit bigger. This was when I put the PowerPoint presentation together. 57 patients were seen using this TIDO exam. The preliminary data, obviously, this is where the huge cost savings come in. We've been able to show about a 45, almost 46% emergency room avoidance rate. 
The COVID impact has really been hard to quantify, but obviously uh, things continue to move. Patients are still in the hospital and getting discharged throughout the pandemic. So we're, we're looking at that and we're continuing to assess the data that we have. Moving really more toward that direct to consumer where the patient is at home. And I've referred to our on-demand service a couple of times. Our on-demand service is again, that video service for urgent care kinds of things. So traditionally without the Taito device, it's just video. Patients are logging in through their patient portal, they're getting in line and they wanna see the next available provider. And you have basically whatever exam you can do based on just your smartphone. However, as we started marketing and selling the devices to patients individually, we partnered with TitoCare to sell those devices directly from our, our website. We allowed patients that are employees to purchase the devices via payroll deduction. We've done a lot of marketing. Now we're, we're getting to the point where we can start to say, hey, by the way, the, this Taito device actually allows you to get that physical exam at home, where a lot of people were sometimes concerned, well, what is the doctor going to do for me if I just talk to them on video? Well, now, if they can hear their heart and their lung sounds and they can get more of that physical exam, more patients are comfortable with that opportunity. Some patients still would prefer to come in person. But as we're looking at the next you know, surge with COVID and the Delta variant and things like that, there is definitely hesitancy to come into a physical location. And now that we can get this in the hands of patients where they can conduct these visits from home, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of benefits and advantages, especially as we move toward uh, another cold and flu season as it's getting uh, you know, closer to fall and then winter. I'm not really willing to think about that already, but that's the reality. Challenges that we've faced, patient purchase. The device is $299, and that is sometimes completely out of the realm of possibility for folks. So we're looking at opportunities to have this potentially covered by our health insurance plan. We, we do know that the device is flexible health spending or HSA, health savings account uh, eligible. This is a device that you can purchase with those FSA or HSA dollars but trying to communicate that out. And again, patients are very concerned how they spend their dollars, even on those savings accounts. So it's an opportunity. And then patient Wi-Fi access and comfort with technology. While the device is fairly easy to use, obviously it can be somewhat confusing, but we wanna make sure that we're, we're communicating to patients and making it as easy as possible. Having that integrated workflow with the, uh, with the patient portal helps immensely but the patients still have to pair the device with their home Wi-Fi. Uh, there's some restrictions based on, you know, it can't be 5G with some of the devices. So there's a little bit of technology hurdle to work through. And we're looking at ways in which we can make that experience even better. We're looking at setting up more of a patient help desk or tech help desk for them. And we do have information, patient, patient facing information like tip sheets, and videos, things like that. So we continue to evolve our process. We're, uh, we have a patient family advisory committee that we talk to, we, we bring information to them, we listen to their feedback and we try to develop things based on their feedback to make it easier for our patients. To date, we have over 350 devices sold. Uh, last count, I heard it was 370 and continuing to grow. If you think about the millions of encounters we have in a year, and I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of thousands or possibly millions of patients we see in a year, that's a pretty small number, but it, it, it is getting to the point where it is a significant enough number where, again, patients with those devices are looking to have those exam-enabled visits with their provider. Uh, and again, we started with just this on-demand service and patients who bought the device said, well, I want to be able to see my primary care provider too. So I'll talk about that in just a minute. COVID impact, of course, it increased demand as patients were concerned about going and physically being in person. One of our newer setups for our Taito Care or our Taito Pro, and this is more of a clinic to clinic setup, is a specialty center. And the need was really to get patients easy access to specialists who are way outside of our metropolitan area. We wanted them to have that convenient access 
to specialists. And those specialists really do need a physical exam for the patient, whether it's for a new consultation or for a follow-up visit, the providers still need to have kind of eyes and ears on the patient and virtual hands. The intervention is that we looked at a location that was about 100 miles away from our main campus and having that medical office available and staffing it with MAs and mid-level providers to facilitate exams. For right now, we're looking at about 20 different specialty services using that Tito Pro device. The big challenge that we've kind of come across is coordinating the schedule between that patient site and the provider schedule. When we're looking at different specialists across a host of different physical locations where they're seeing inpatient or they're seeing physical patients in the clinic, as well as these video visits at a distance, that coordination becomes a little bit challenging and that scheduling becomes a little bit challenging. And to be honest, we're, we're still working through our lessons learned and how to, to do best practices and make that process a lot more smooth. The electronic medical record or EPIC does um, make it easy for scheduling, but the only way that that works well is if it's built on the back end and the provider schedules are built appropriately so that the EMR can actually do its thing and find appointments and kind of do some auto magical things for our schedulers. So again, we're still working through what those best practices look like. And then of course, ensuring that there's adequate bandwidth and connectivity for the devices at that patient location. Again, the device is using wireless and Wi-Fi. We wanna make sure that there's good connectivity to be able to show the video of the patient as well as have those exams uh, transmitted across that distance. Right now we've got 28 providers and over 12 specialties that started seeing patients in mid-July. We've just recently added additional providers on specialties to that. And long-term we're looking at other opportunities in other locations to be able to do this as well. The COVID impact, obviously there's increased demand as patients have put off going to see a doctor in person. And again, patients who are unwilling to travel uh, at a greater distance. And now that COVID's happened and that they know virtual can be done, more and more patients want to have that virtual option. Or in this case, they're still physically coming into a clinic, but not having to drive that distance to where their provider is physically located. Circling back to our direct-to-consumer, primary care scheduled video visits started as of mid-June. Our big challenge here though, is we have a large pool of primary care providers. We have a small number of patients who have these devices in their hand and does it line up with a scheduled visit that they might have? So there's a lot of variables here that say, gosh, the likelihood of a primary care physician actually doing one of these exam enabled visits in you know, a short time frame, it's not very high. So how do we train someone, make sure that they know how to do it, that they're comfortable with the technology when they might not have their first visit for weeks or months at, at this point? So that's been a challenge. We, we've tackled that in a couple of different ways with, um, you know, again, training materials that are online, recorded sessions and ongoing live sessions where we can try to train that. We're also looking at schedules we've got folks who are proactively reviewing the schedules for a particular visit type that would be this device enabled exam. And they're reaching out proactively to those providers as well to make sure that they're, um, they're ready to do that visit. One of the other opportunities then of course would be specialty services. Oncology had reached out to us, uh, gosh, sometime last year and asked us, uh, actually even before that, and asked us, is there an opportunity to do this with our patients? And so they had, a, they had a couple of different grant programs where they were looking to target a specific population of patients. In this case, it was a patient population taking oral chemotherapy. They need to do a certain number of check-in visits at, throughout the course of their treatment. And they realized that they could probably do every other visit virtually as long as they had that physical exam. As we move forward, obviously, we're looking at other opportunities to do specialty services in this way as well. 
the more, the more services are available for the patients who are buying the device, the more value they'll see and the more likely they will be to buy it or at least uh, tell others to buy it as well. One of our best, or some of our best practices and lessons learned is really getting a detail form. We call it our detail form to ensure that we're collecting all of the information that we need to get the project kicked off, built, uh, that we have all the information for training and that we're ready when we go live with a particular service. It is critical from our standpoint to have not only an administrative champion, but also a clinical champion. We have to have that admin and that doctor or again, clinical staff working together because if we don't have, you know, we've got to have the, the money and the, the medical reason, right, working together. If we don't have both of those people at the table, these programs are not very successful. And then determining responsibility for the various tasks. Who's doing what? Who's getting the equipment? Who's making sure that the data network is in place? Uh, who's taking care of training and ongoing training as we onboard new people? Uh, communication about the program, those kinds of things. Documentation of equipment requirements. This is huge. We need to talk about and talk through the process because again, virtual care, we're helping facilitate the, pro the program, but we're not there to implement and do the ongoing maintenance of the program. So we wanna make sure that the end users in our case are understanding of you know, how, how are you maintaining things like usernames and passwords, network connectivity, who do you call if things go wrong? How are you sanitizing the equipment between patients, labeling, charging, where do you store it? If you need it, you know, maybe you don't need it for a day or two, but then on the third day you need it, how are you going to find it? And again, accessibility, making sure that if it's in a closet that everybody who needs it has access to that closet. Hopefully it's not locked with only one person who has a key and they're not in the office that day. Creating and reviewing a workflow, this is critical, especially if we're in a non-integrated situation with the electronic medical record, we wanna make sure that we have a workflow that makes sense. You know, What happens at each step of the way, who's responsible for that? And we validate that workflow in a dress rehearsal. We found that those dress rehearsals are pretty critical. Not only can we use those dress rehearsals to find any gaps in the process, but we can also a lot of times use that dress rehearsal to troubleshoot any technology or to test all of our technology pieces. As we move forward, we're looking at integration of our patient vitals that we get from Tito Care into the electronic medical record system. So we've just been able to integrate Pulse Ox. So there is a Pulse Ox um, Bluetooth device that can pair with the Tito Care, and we can pull that information directly into the patient chart. Sometime later this year, we're looking at pulling some of those other vitals into the patient chart as well, so that the providers have a few less clicks and a few less types <laughs> to get that into the patient record as part of that encounter for the patient. Some of the next steps we're looking at, expanding our direct to consumer. We're, we're hoping that as we sell more devices, we will see more primary care scheduled visits. As we have those visits, we're trying to gather feedback where we can and identify any areas for improvement, either from the patient end or from the provider end, see what's working well, see what's not working so well and where we can kind of find our best practices and help move that process along. Working with additional specialties, this is obviously uh, going to be very beneficial. Again, the more services that a patient can see using that device, the more value they see for that device. There is also an opportunity with our Tito Care devices to do what's called an examine forward, where the patient can actually do an exam uh, using the device, and then there's a potential for them to forward it to a provider for review. So in an asynchronous format, a, a provider can get a physical exam and respond to that patient accordingly. So we're looking at an opportunity to do it that way. We do have some existing programs that are not integrated with Epic. And one of the examples of that would be our school-based program. Again, they were live well before we had the opportunity to integrate Tito Care with, our, with Epic. So moving forward, any programs like that, we're looking for the opportunity to integrate that with Epic less clicks, less passwords to remember, a much more smooth process for both the patient and the provider end. And then we're looking at additional use cases. We have some new mom engagement programs that we're looking to really 
uh, get those new moms engaged, possibly uh, doing some meet and greet with pediatrics. Telehealth and student athletes, we're looking at opportunities for that, especially as we're looking at different opportunities in schools. And then targeted patient population. So through our, you know, our Healthy Planet and our, our community outreach, who else should we be targeting? How can we reach these patients? And really, how can we give them a better experience and a better value and keep them safe with potentially not having to be exposed or coming into clinics? So there's a lot of opportunity out there. And as we get more comfortable with the technology, we're seeing where those, where those opportunities are going to present themselves and how we can move forward. So in conclusion, our device-enabled exams really do offer a more comprehensive access to healthcare. We're looking to meet those patient expectations for online services and hopefully exceed their expectations because we're able to provide this physical exam. Where we can, we want to reduce costs. Really on the patient side, obviously it's time, travel, convenience. And, and in some cases, like with our, our skilled nursing facility, we're reducing that time and travel for our providers as well so that they can do what they do uh, more effectively and more efficiently instead of having to spend a lot of time in the car. Reducing exposure, especially in this time of COVID is really important. And really looking at radical convenience for our patients. This is what patients are looking for. As, as more and more quick and easy options come to market, we wanna make sure that we are, as a traditional healthcare system, able to provide that radical convenience and achieve market differentiation for, for ourselves. And again, making sure that the patients are getting that great experience. We wanna connect with those customers where, when, and how they wanna be reached. And all for you is our motto. So I just will pause there. Becky, I don't know if there's any questions or if there's anything I can go back to, but I'd be happy to answer. Thanks so much, Marie. And I do have a whole bunch of questions oh, that boy. have come in. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we're going to keep you busy here. All right. So let's see where we're going to start. Um, and again, thank you so much. I, I didn't get to see your presentation during conference. So um, where do you find the providers who are willing to participate in the virtual exams for complete strangers? Wow, that's a great question. So we do have a pool of providers that are doing our on-demand service. And they kind of signed up for this in the beginning. Um, and, and so even before the, the physical exam piece was, was available, this was just for video visits. So this, was, uh, this started with a small group of primary care providers and has kind of expanded to a larger group of primary care providers. I think in the beginning, some of them were voluntold. Um, but uh, as we've moved forward through the program, we found that some providers really enjoy it. Um, and in some cases, we have some newer providers that have a smaller, um, a smaller patient panel, and they're actually establishing some great new connections with patients that are new to the system and, and are now establishing with that provider as a, their primary care provider. So it's been, it's been really great. So it was, again, in the beginning, it was a little bit of a voluntold situation, but as the programs developed, uh, it's definitely more volunteer and off hours. Uh, there are some financial incentives that providers are getting um, and during, I guess, business hours. They're, um, they're getting, I don't, release time is, is more of an academic term, but they're, they're getting time out of their schedule. So um, instead of physically seeing patients in the clinic for a chunk of time, when they're on shift, their, um, their, their schedule is not available in their regular physical clinic, and they're, they're just covering that on demand and or the employer clinics. Okay. Yeah, that, that was my next question is, are these full-time employed physicians or are they uh, physicians or providers that are at the end of their career and you know, just want to supplement or, you know, that type of thing? So it's, it's an interesting, um, that, that's an interesting concept. And I think the majority are full-time providers. I think that in some cases we've had requests from providers that are kind of at the end of their career and wanted to do that. I, I don't know that that's specifically worked out um, yet, but I know that that's an option. And obviously as providers, now that we've learned that the, the pandemic has, has pushed providers out of the clinic and they can do this from home, um, we are seeing more, more providers, especially on a particular shift or especially when they're covering off shift, um, doing this from home. 
as long as they have a professional environment in their home environment. Mm -hmm. Um, so it does open up some interesting opportunities and, you know, we do have some providers now who are working physically in our sort of same day clinics that are also picking up additional shifts. So it's going to be a combination, I think, of, of those different providers moving forward for our health system. Okay. Next question. Are these services Medicaid and Medicare reimbursable? You mentioned they are insurance billed. Yes. So again, um, from the, the pandemic has really opened up a lot of opportunity for, um, for Medicare and Medicaid to cover these services. I think as we move out of the public health emergency, we have to keep an eye on, um, you know, will there be any restrictions moving forward on telehealth? And I know Becky, you've got plenty of webinars that (laughs) talk about those. So I I probably will not (laughs) expand too much on that. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, uh, right now I'm waiting to see what comes out in the comments and the final fee schedule for Medicare. So fingers crossed. Exactly. (laughs) Um, I assume these services are performed in Michigan. So is, d- does Henry Ford Health System have any plans to extend their market area outside of Michigan? So again, in, um, because of the pandemic, there are the, the medical licensure waivers across different states. We know a lot of those are expiring right now. One of the things that we found is that uh, Florida has its own telehealth licensure. It's actually a free telehealth licensure. So all of our on-demand providers have gotten their Florida telehealth license. Um, And kind of across primary care, we're looking at having everybody be available to see patients in Florida because from Michigan to Florida, that's where a lot of our snowbirds go during the winter time. So it's been really convenient, uh, obviously, for patients in, in a, of, of our health system where they're maybe up here during the summer to continue seeing their providers over the winter in, uh, in Florida. Uh, I think it makes sense for us to look at opportunities. And, and as we're moving forward, we're looking at um, not only the, uh, the compact and what it takes to get licensed in those different states. Mm-hmm. I guess the short answer is yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't, and, and we're looking at it. We're looking at opportunities. Florida was, I think the low, low hanging fruit because of the ease of their telehealth um, mm-hmm. licensure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you, so you're kind of on the, what the West, Northwest, Southwest side of Detroit. I mean, do you, does your general market area go into Ohio? Do you have patients that come from Ohio to see you? Certainly for specialty services. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's fair to say, Um, you know, when you're talking about things like transplant or or possibly very specialized oncology, there's a, we have a lot of subspecialties, I think that, that folks will come to Detroit, but also, you know, coming from Ohio, they could also be going to, um, to Michigan Medicine, you know, so there's a couple of different ways they can go. Um, I think the other concern we always have is folks coming over from Windsor. Actually, we probably have more more patients that are interested in coming from Windsor or Canada um, mm-hmm. than than Ohio. But I, I, again, I'm probably not the best person to speak mm-hmm. to that. I know that we have um, our referring physicians office that that looks at what those out of state and um, mm-hmm. out of country patients look like. Yeah. That's a whole nother Pandora's it is. box. That's, that's, a, that's a whole nother <laughs> webinar. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll, we'll do that one. Um, okay, so here's a great question. How do you track hardware in nursing homes? Great question. Um, so far, the nursing home owns the equipment. So that's how we track it. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> they lose it, it's their fault. They're right. Problem. Well, but I mean, it's been, it's been a, that's definitely a huge consideration is, you know, this is a program we're partnering with them and, and who owns the equipment. And if we own the equipment, obviously we have to maintain it and worry about it. But uh, if they own it, then, then it's their equipment. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, if a rural resident, well, actually, before I ask this, sure. we're getting to the end of the questions as a reminder, if you have questions, um, click on the Q and a Um, button or icon down at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask a question. All right. If a rural resident wants to participate in a virtual visit that is scheduled in a designated location, 
such as in a library, you know, private room, uh, can a retired nurse, or I'm sorry, can a retired nurse, comma, student nurse, comma, paramedic, comma, et cetera, be trained and scheduled to assist the resident with telehealth equipment for a general health exam? I mean, the short answer is yes. Are we asking this from a billing standpoint? I don't think so, because from a billing standpoint, well, Go ahead and answer it from a billing standpoint, but I don't think that's why they're asking the question. Yeah, well, I mean, again, it depends. So ask the question one more time. I'm sorry, sure. I want to make sure I get that. So thinking about no originating site, borders, patient sure. can be anywhere. Um, we've heard a lot, re I've heard a lot recently about telehealth happening in libraries. So people in rural oh. areas don't have internet access at home. Sure. They go to a hub in their community and any thoughts that you might have from either a licensure perspective, from a billing perspective in general about um, retired nurses, student nurses, paramedics, et cetera, being volunteered to help with the medical equipment so that they could have a more comprehensive physical exam. Yeah, I think, I think the, um... It really just follows the rule where the patient's not in a, in a qualified medical facility. So as long as the insurance covers the patient in the home or not in a qualified medical facility, then I think the short answer is absolutely yes. The device is, the device is very easy um, and it's, it's really intended for non-medical folks to use. It's just, like I said, it's a pretty easy, quick and easy kit. But to that end, I think that that's a great point is that there is an opportunity, obviously, for, for those folks to be able to use that. Now, if that retired nurse or that student nurse is working on behalf of the health system, um, then it becomes a little bit more interesting in terms of, you know, are we, um, like, like when, we, when we are in a different medical facility, we have to have like either a timeshare agreement or a BAA or something. So th those are some very interesting legal um, implications. I'm, I, I'm not comfortable answering that right now, um, but I, I like the concept. I mean, I think the concept would be very similar to where some of these, um, you know, medical kiosks are being set up in grocery stores, for example, and very similar devices are being used and they're, you know, they've got an MA there uh, and they're connecting back to a provider. So I would assume it's very similar where you've got that physical, um, that physical space. I think we would just have to make sure that, um, you know, from a compliance standpoint, we're able to do medicine there. But yeah, if there's, if there's a room and, you know, it, what's the difference between going into the grocery store and having like a kiosk set up what, and, or maybe a room of a library mm -hmm. set up but yeah, good idea. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yes, I got to follow up. Yes. Volunteer assistance, which was kind of where my brain was going. Yeah. I was even thinking about um, parish nurse programs. Sure. And those types of people or community health workers. Um, I did get a follow up. Uh, in other words, does the facilitator need to be licensed? And yeah, my answer in this was case, that. no, yeah. no, because again, it, it's it's meant for a, a, a patient to use, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so in my mind, if you're in a kiosk in a grocery store or in a pharmacy or in a library, the person helping the patient be, is a um, telehealth liaison yes. in my mind. Yeah. So they don't have to be licensed, they're just helping with the equipment. Correct. Yep. All right. We are at the end of our time for today. I'm going to give wow, one last call for questions. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add, Marie? No, I just really appreciate everyone's time and attention today. And again, thanks for the opportunity to present this again. Uh, it's, it's an evolving process for us and we're, we're, we're learning as we go. And uh, I know the providers are really happy with the ability to get that additional physical information from a patient or about a patient as they, um, as they make their, uh, you know, better, better uh, diagnosis and treatment plans. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Marie, for being with us and presenting this information. Yeah, thank always you. appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, mm -hmm. everybody. Have, one, have a great day, everyone. Thanks.